There it goes. Cool. All right. So my plan for today is to go through really briefly some of the main equations and ideas you'll need to know for the topics that will be on the final. Again, final is this Friday. It'll be 50 minutes, non-cumulative, so it's only the stuff after the midterm. Um, there'll be eight questions plus probably a, an extra credit question at the end. Um, it'll, uh, it'll be a similar format. Cool, thanks. Um, it'll be a similar format to the midterm, so four questions where you won't need any, uh, any calculator, and then four where a calculator may be useful. Um, you can have one sheet of notes, one-sided, handwritten. Um, what else? Uh, you could. There, I don't know if they would be terribly useful. Yeah. I meant like in addition to that. Sure. Why not? <laughs> so if you use the same sheet, you can you can have that sheet with you, or just write on the other side. But it'll be different topics, so I don't know. Aside aside from beam bending, that's the one set of equations that'll still be there. Um, yeah. Why not? Okay. Um, any other questions before we get started? <coughs> will everything will, it, will everything in lecture is there anything outside of lecture notes that might be on the test? Like is there something that you only cover in things online? Uh what do you mean the written thing? Oh, like the typeset lecture notes? So fatigue, I still haven't typed up the fatigue notes, but I posted the, the ones from last year. So you have um, basically the, the handwritten copy of what I would be transcribing into the, into the notes there. Um, the, I will say for the extra credit problem, actually, oh, question. How's the, how's the Charpy lab going for those who have done it? Cool, interesting. Straightforward. Did you see? Did you see a ductile to brittle transition? All right, and you saw that trend. So, I I will give a hint that the extra credit might have something to do with that, which is not something I expect you to know from the lecture notes necessarily because we haven't really talked about it. But that's why it would be an extra credit problem. So the normal the the other eight problems should all be out of the lecture notes minus fatigue, which I might be able to typeset today, but if not, I, s I have the handwritten version of the notes that you can look at. Um, and it's also chapter 14 in the book. But there'll probably be one conceptual question from fatigue. So. Cool. Other questions before we get going? OK. So. Again, I'll run through these topics really quick, and then I'll hopefully leave time at the end for us to go through either the, the, mid, the practice problems that I gave for the final or the extra practice problems that were at the ends of the homeworks, um, all of which are similar uh, to the types of problems that will be on the exam. I think this one is a, the practice problems I gave are a little bit more matched with, with the difficulty you can expect. OK. so. Uh, first, let's talk about beams, plasticity in beams. So the first thing, uh, so this is where uh, you should have your three and four point bending relationships from before. So if I have a load P on a simply supported beam, I know the, the maximum moment happens uh, for a beam that's length L here, happens in the middle, and it's some PL over 4. The displacement max is also at the middle, L over 2 uh, is PL cubed over 48EI. Uh, for four point bending, if I have two load with a P, this is still simply supported. Uh, this is some distance A away for a beam of length L. 
the m uh, is equal everywhere here in the gauge, m max is everywhere from a to l minus a, uh, and it's p a over two, p a over two, and the displacement max, um, you probably don't need to know, uh, but I'm gonna write it down anyway. Uh, it's p a over 48 e i 3 l not 4 3 l minus 4 a cubed where i remember is the area or the second moment of area moment of area uh, and it's pi over 4 r to the fourth for a circle and uh, 1 12th bh cubed for a rectangle of height h, h and b. There we go. So those are the, this is stuff that would have been covered on the last exam. Um, you mainly need to know it for the moment because then the stress directly relates to that moment. So the maximum stress in a body is mz over i, where z is now distance from the neutral plane. And we actually went through then the derivation for why this equation was what it was. Um, but then the, the important things uh, for plasticity in beams now is we have to figure out where the maximum bending moment is. So now if, if I have some moment in a beam, the, I can figure out where this beam will start to deform plastically. So now if this is my stress and this is my distance z from the neutral plane, um, what I'm looking for is the point where the stress hits the yield stress of the material um, at um, now at that uh, maximum distance from the from the top of the beam, and I can say the moment where that starts to initiate, the moment where this beam will start deforming plastically, and I get plastic deformation along the top and bottom edges of the beam um, is. Sigma y i over c over c, uh, where this is just half the height, <coughs> or uh, the max distance from the neutral plane. So this is uh, reorganizing that equation. I just say if my maximum stress is the yield stress, I bring that i over and the z down to the bottom. Sigma y i over z. Um, there's some intermediate point where this will have some plastic deformation along the top surfaces. And that moment distribution will look something like this for an elastic, perfectly plastic beam, which is the only case you need to know. Uh, and this is then sigma y, z, um, not z, sigma. And then eventually, this will form a plastic hinge where the plastic region will touch in the middle. So the plastic, the, plas the whole beam will be deforming plastically through the center. I get plasticity everywhere in here. Um, and that, at that point, uh, I assume that I have essentially a flat profile here. So this is when the, the distance from the neutral plane to the to the yield point is approximately zero. Uh, Z sigma. So now my whole beam in the center section has yielded. Uh, and this happens at an M naught of uh, three halves MI, which we went through the derivation for. Yeah. Is that does that mean that P 
P over two would be at each of these points. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you said for this case we need to know perfectly um, or elastic perfectly elastic. Um, but for torsion we use a power law. Right? Yeah. So I probably won't be putting a torsion problem on the exam because you already did a whole lab on it and because you didn't do a whole lab on plasticity in beams though. I know. Um, but so, and then torsion plasticity, because the equations are a lot more convoluted, it's, it's harder to do in a, in a short problem. So I'll, I'll probably not have torsion plasticity on there, because mainly because we derived it for uh, plastic hardening material. Yeah. Cool. Other questions on the plasticity in beams? All right. So once we got past that, we started talking about buckling. CKLG. There's one equation, or I guess two equations you need to know. Um, there's the critical load for buckling, is that pi squared EI over KL squared, where this K is a, is a constant due to the boundary conditions. Uh, so this is our our effective length factor. Length factor. Um, factor. Where uh, for a pinned pinned beam, K is 1. For a fixed pinned beam, something like that. For a fixed pin beam, k is like 0 0.7 ish, and we showed I showed the derivation for that. Um, for a fixed fixed beam, which is what you had done in your buckling lab, um, k is 0 0.5, and for a fixed free beam, like something like that, um, k is two. So. Know that equation, know when to use these k's. Uh, this i is that same i. I probably won't do anything other than cylinders or rectangles. Um, so you can use the same moment of inertia relationships. The other equation you should know from this is when this will transition. So the critical slenderness at which it will preferentially buckle or preferentially yield. And so we can find that by setting the yield strength equal to the critical buckling point, uh, which is pi squared e i over a k l squared, which we rewrite as pi squared e over uh, k squared s squared. So we can find that critical slenderness uh, when that transition will happen between buckling and yielding to be uh, pi over k square root of e over sigma y. There we go. And so you had done this case in your uh, in the buckling lab, uh, and you had looked at how that transition happens, what that looks like for different beams. Sorry, uh, so I might have, you might have said this, but I might have missed it. On, are you going to give us those effective length factors like on a test, or should we put them on the note sheet? I'll tell you what the boundary conditions are, but so I won't. You should put the numbers on the sheet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it, it, I won't do anything more complicated than any of these four. Um, yeah. Because technically I could have, yeah. It, yeah. These are like the, the simplest four cases. But you'd say it's but like a fixed fixed if you wouldn't say k equals 0.5. No. I would say you have a fixed fixed beam or a pinned pinned beam. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the stuff for buckling. Any questions on buckling? Okay, I'll probably have uh, one or two problems on beam buckling, just because I happen to like buckling a lot. Uh, as a, yeah, showing my bias. Uh, stress concentrations, what's next? 
those concentrations. So here <clears throat> we looked at the stress now around a semi-infinite plate with a hole in it, which you're all probably studying to death with the DIC lab. No? <laughs> Maybe you're all terribly sick of stress concentrations now. Um, if we have a far field applied stress sigma naught, uh, then there's a stress concentration here at the top and bottom of the beam, or of the, sorry, of the hole of three sigma naught, and a, a compressive stress at the edges of the beam of negative sigma naught. So those are your two stress concentration factors. So I guess you have a stress concentration factor of three and negative one there. Um, and we had shown a couple different examples of how you superimpose those. So if I have biaxial or shear, I guess shear was your homework problem, you can always uh, break it into some, con uh, some combination of axial stresses and then use that to figure out what the stress concentration at the point at, along the hole is. Um, there's a general relationship for the hoop stress at the edge of the beam, R equals A, of sigma naught one minus two cosine of two theta. Um, so that's the, the hoop stress at the edge of the hole, and that's where these uh, three and minus one come from. So we have one plus two and then one minus two, give you a, a three and a minus one. Um, and so it varies along the edge there. Uh, so no <coughs> stress concentrations and no how to do superpositions. So if I, if I take, um, I think I had shown the example for biaxial stress. If I have stress there, stress there, stress there, and these are both sigma naught, then the stress uh, ends up being three sigma naught minus sigma naught, or two sigma naught, um, based on that summation of the stress concentrations. And we had gone through a couple different examples around that in class. Okay, questions on stress concentrations? Yeah. Yeah, uh, don't worry, I won't give any problems on pressure vessels because I haven't covered them. I, I throw them in example problems because they're useful equations to know because pressure vessels come up a lot in engineering. Um, and I know, I think most of you at some point have seen them, but because I haven't explicitly covered them here, I won't put them on the exam. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Other questions? Stress concentrations? All right. Um, so then we started getting into fracture mechanics. And so all of the last three topics were kind of centered around fracture mechanics and how that affects material strength. Um, fracture mechanics. So for fracture, I'll, I, I'll probably have one simple numerical problem and one or two conceptual problems. Um, or, yeah, related to it. Um, but I'll try not to make it much more difficult than anything that you've seen in the homework. I, in fact, it'll probably be a little bit simpler than what you've seen in the homework. But So uh, fracture mechanics here, we're studying how cracks propagate in materials. Um, so this is how cracks propagate. So I showed different fracture modes. Uh, which I call one, two, and three because we're creative. <coughs> Here we go. So mode one, which is the most common mode, is an opening mode. Opening or mode one. Uh, shear is the next most common, mode 2, 
and then uh, out of plane shear. Uh, so tearing is our mode three. We had given a stress intensity factor. So uh, from our stress concentrations for a, a circular hole, we have this, uh, that relationship of, of three and minus sigma. I had shown you for an elliptical hole, there's, there's a factor of uh, A over B here where the cosine is. Um, but so then as, as our hole get, or as our crack gets infinitely sharp, or as our hole becomes a very highly elongated ellipse, um, we get a theoretically infinite stress concentration at the tip of the hole. So what we do instead is we quantify a stress intensity based on the length of the crack. So Ki is um, our far field applied stress square root of pi A, where now A is the length of the crack here for a plate of some width W. Um, and technically there's a, there's a Y out front based on the aspect ratio of the thing. Um, if I give you a problem that needs a Y, I'll, I'll give you what that Y coefficient is. So you don't need to memorize what they are. Just know that uh, this is basically a correction for, say, if I have a very small crack in a part versus a very deep crack in a part. This Y would be different for these two scenarios based on the boundary conditions, because here there's that free boundary for a deeper crack. Um, so this Ki is our, our stress intensity factor. Stress intensity factor, which comes from geometry and uh, the applied stress. So that applied stress is sigma naught, the geometry of the Y and the A there. Yeah. So just to clarify, if you don't give us the Y value, are we to assume that it's true? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll probably I'll try to make it explicit in the in any problems I give them with too. Um, so with that stress intensity, uh, so the stress intensity is geometric. We relate it now to material failure as a critical stress intensity. So we give some KIC, which is our um, critical stress intensity, which now we assume to be a material property. Technically, it's it's still dependent on geometry. It's dependent on, ex on exactly how cra sharp that crack is. But um, as a rule of thumb, we, we take it to be a material property. Um, and tests for it are often challenging. But um, so there's. Whereas like uniaxial tension is a fairly simple test, fracture tests are, are very complicated and you have to be very careful in doing them. Uh, so the exact value of that KIC generally has more error associated with it. But um, anyway, so uh, KIC is the, the stress intensity where that material will fail. So we can use that stress intensity uh, to say if I have a fixed, uh, a fixed stress on a material or a fixed crack size, I can then say, Failure will happen uh, for fixed stress uh, or for, sorry, for fixed crack size first, for fixed A. Um, then I can find the critical stress is KIC over Y square root pi A or for fixed uh, far field stress, I can find the critical crack size. AC um, is one over pi KIC over sigma, um, sigma naught squared here. So with either of these, I can figure out where parts are going to fail. Is this KIC the critical stress intensity? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, so KIC is what we what we call our fracture toughness. Thanks. Um, so we also have a, a GC value. So uh, a G value, which we define to be uh, K 
i squared over e from our Irwin criteria. Uh, and this is the, the crack growth or the energy release rate. Uh, sorry, E star, where now E star changes depending on whether we're in a state of plane stress or plane strain. So this is either the Young's modulus or the Young's modulus divided by one minus nu squared, um, depending on whether we're in plane strain. No, plane stress. Yes. I think it's plain stress. Thank you. Um, then we can define a GC similarly. So GC is KIC squared over E star. And this is what we're going to call our toughness or our, our, our critic, either the critical energy release rate or the toughness. So a lot of the ambiguity that comes, or a lot of the confusion that comes in defining fracture, or in defining toughness of a material, comes first because a lot of the time uh, toughness gets uh, defined as the energy under a curve for a tension test. Um, so that's how much energy it takes to break a material, but that's not a fracture toughness necessarily. KIC is a fracture toughness. Um, or this is what we what we define to be a fracture toughness, and this is the stress, based effectively the stress that it takes to cause a crack to grow. Um, but then this GC is also commonly referred to as a toughness, and it so so where KIC is fracture toughness, GC is just toughness. Uh, and so this I think is a more intuitive concept of how difficult it is to tear something. So rubber and leather have a very high toughness but a relatively low KIC because they're very soft materials. And when you divide by that E, you get rid of the, the contribution to this, of the stiffness to the, to the material toughness. In what way is that a rate? It's just, it's just energy release. So the way it gets defined is it's how much energy how much energy gets released as, as a crack grows in a material. So if I have, yeah. So it's, it's the change in energy as a crack grows. So that you, you have this uh, energy release. It, it's not a time rate, it's a, it's a rate with crack. Yeah, it's a distance rate, which is extra confusing. Yeah. yeah. This goes back to the last topic, sorry to get back, but um, for buckling, the yeah. No. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Um, I show it because I don't just like throwing these out without any explanation, and I think the the derivation of sorry the derivation of them is something you can follow now that you have uh, a little bit more background in beam theory because you, you use beam theory plus a little bit to derive all these these coefficients <coughs> in this uh, Euler buckling relationship. So that's why I wanted to show it. But yeah, for the for the test, just know these relationships. Okay. Um, so uh, from now for fracture, there was the idea of a stress field so we know that the stress in the material is proportional to one over the square root of R. So from the tip of a crack, I theoretically have uh, an infinite stress at the tip of a crack. This where this is stress and this is distance away from the crack tip. Um, but in reality, I am capped at some intrinsic yield strength of the material. So um, I have uh, now some plastic radius, some RP of my material, and I gave an estimate for that plastic zone size uh, as approximately 1 over 2 pi k i c over sigma y squared. Yes. Um, 
And so we had to then say, based on the size of this plastic zone, uh, whether we could do a valid fracture test. And we say, for different materials, we can plug in a couple constants, figure out what the plastic zone size, and to perform valid fracture tests. Fracture um, means the part size is much greater than our plastic zone size for valid fracture tests. Okay, um, so uh, fracture stuff, yeah. Um, so for instead of like having a crack on the edge, there was an internal crack like that's not at the edge of the cycle, but it's like inside. Yeah. Uh -huh. You use like half of the crack length as your value. Uh, yeah. So well. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, by convention, because when fracture mechanics started getting studied, they were looking at the crack depth into the material. When we then started looking at internal cracks, we defined that as two, two um, a, just to match. This is this is effectively like half of that. This crack on the side. So by convention, if there's an internal crack, you call it width 2A uh, for part width 2W. This also matches where, um, if we assume it's an ellipse, so 2A is the is the semi-major axis of an ellipse, uh, where A is the, like A would be the, the semi-major radius, semi-major something. I'm forgetting all my ellipse terms. Yeah, but it, it also relates to ellipses. But So it's, it's partly that and partly the convention of having an A defined as the distance from the edge of the sample. Um, but I don't, this distinction shouldn't really come into play for the exam. Yeah. Okay. So wait, just to clarify, like, to use like the formula for like sigma critical, if it's an internal crack in the two-way length, Uh, yeah, you would use half of it, I think. Actually, scratch that. I need to double check that now. I, yeah, you shouldn't need to worry about it. Um, we had also, we had also defined from these uh, factor of safety for the cracks. So, um, if I know what the critical crack stress is, I know what uh, factor of safety I can have. So uh, the factor of safety for the crack uh, or for the for the stress, um, I just have that max uh, this critical stress over the applied stress uh, and factor of safety for the flaw size for the flaw size is the critical flaw size over the actual flaw size. Um, so these are also useful relationships to remember for the exam. Okay. Other questions on fracture toughness? Oh, this one. Sorry. Okay. So um, the two last topics we had talked about were Weibull distributions of failure, Weibull uh, failure. For that, for Weibull now, we say this is particularly applicable for brittle materials. Um, I have some distribution now of strengths, the probability of failure of my material uh, against the applied stress. Uh, and if I plot this on a funky double log, natural log of natural log of 1 over 1 minus f um, versus the natural log of sigma, I get a straight line that is, uh, now the slope of this is an m, which I call my Weibull modulus.
f is the f is the probability of failure. So um, f now in terms of stress and v, this is our our failure probability. Probability is one minus exp of negative v over v naught sigma over sigma naught to the m. Um, the important things to remember here are that um, now f this m basically defines how how uh, wide the distribution of flaws is that you have in your material. So if m m is uh, big, we have a wide distribution of flaws. And if m, oh, sorry, switch that. If m is small, we have, if m is small, we have a wide distribution of flaws. And if m uh, is big, we have a narrow distribution. So basically, this is saying, if there's exactly one applied stress, if my m were infinite, um, that this thing fails at, I would have exactly one flaw size in my material, because then that one critical flaw size would be I, I could I know deterministically um, what if I if I know exactly what my a is I know exactly what stress will cause this thing to fail, and the reason I get a distribution is because I have a distribution of flaws. So because I have a distribution of flaws, I don't know exactly what critical stress I need to apply in actual materials, and instead I get a distribution. If I have that m as very low, then I have a very wide distribution of flaws. There's some probability I have a very big flaw that causes me to fail at a low stress, and some probability I have a very small flaw, or I have only small flaws that would cause me to fail at a low stress, or at a, a high stress. Um, so qualitatively understand uh, what this Weibull modulus means and how it would change depending on what types of flaws you have. Um, I probably won't throw a numerical problem at this. It'll be more of a conceptual problem for Weibull statistics. Okay. Then the yeah. Yeah. So this uh, effect. So so v naught is the volume of our reference part. So this is if if I when I obtain the value for v naught and sigma naught, these two are related. So I take a specific part of a specific size, and I call that a, a reference volume of my part, and I test that to failure some number of times. Then if by, uh, I, I would call that a reference volume. Then if I were to increase or decrease my volume from that, I would have statistically more or less flaws in my material. So, so the now the volume of my part is very important for how many flaws can exist in it. So if I take a part that's twice the size, there can be twice as many potential flaws in there. Um, there's And then there's the interesting extreme limit of if I have something on the order of a few tens of nanometers, I can't, I statistically have no flaws in my material, and so I get close to theoretical strengths. But that's a, that's a kind of fun deviation. Yeah, so this, this V-naught is just the reference volume at which I'm finding my failure stresses, or the, the distribution of failure stresses. What is V regular? Yeah, so, so V is, is the volume you're getting when you, when you obtain this V-naught, sigma-naught, and M. And then this V, if you were to test a different sized part later on, then you would use that v. If you were to test the exact same size part, then this would just be one, and you would have that same v naught. Okay. Then the last topic is fatigue. So this one is going to be really a, a very qualitative uh, conceptual problem, but. Um, we had talked about uh, in fatigue, we look at SN curves, so the stress amplitude and the number of cycles to failure. We have three different regimes, generally um, low cycle, cycle, high cycle, 
and our endurance endurance limit. what's happening in here now is as I deform a crack um, so if I have some crack of size a let's erase these if I have some crack of size a uh, and I apply a stress to it it opens up and when I release that stress I then say it's grown some amount a delta a and so I had shown some images of, of fatigued samples, and you see in fatigue samples th these rings. So you actually see a very clear uh, ring as that crack starts to grow. So you can actually post uh, uh, post mortem analyze how much the crack has grown each cycle. But um, mechanistically, this is why fatigue happens. So in our low cycle, we're deforming plastically. Plastically, so this is past the plastic yield point of the actual material in our in our stress strain curve. So stress strain, um, yes. Sorry, stress strain. Um, so if if I'm in my low cycle, I know my stress amplitude is something past the yield strength of the material. If I'm in high cycle, I'm technically deforming my material elastically, but um, even so, so this is what you should be seeing in this DIC lab now. Even though, even if you have a giant gaping hole in your material, you may not see plastic deformation starting at any different point. So the, that plastic yielding point still looks the same between a sample with and without a hole. So cracks in materials don't necessarily show up at the yield point, particularly for metals. So you can still be causing microstructural plastic deformation in the elastic regime. Um, and so that's your your high cycle is elastic deformation. And then eventually, the endurance limit is when you're applying such a low stress that you're actually not deforming, that you're not actually growing cracks at all. So mechanistically, there's there's that idea. And I uh, there's one equation that describes this phenomena, Paris's law, which is the amount that a crack grows per cycle is some constant uh, times the change in stress intensity to some exponent. Um, I'm not going to ask you any numerical problems for this, I, but I'm probably going to throw one conceptual problem testing that you know why fatigue happens, namely that cracks are growing, and uh, mechanistically why would these different regimes would be different. Um, and here, this in this regime, we say that the amount of the, the degradation in the stress to failure is related to some constant uh, times the number of cycles to failure to some exponent. So this is uh, generally a log plot. So it's a uh, this is plot. This would be plotted on a log scale. Yeah. Um, so this would verify the essay on the y-axis of the plot the sigma a and the equation we just wrote on the same ring. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. So that that would be your true elastic regime, where you're actually not causing any cracks to grow or any plasticity to happen. Uh, I'm still trying to type up the fatigue notes. Um, I had, I think I had posted all of the fracture notes on there. And then fatigue, I, I had posted the scan notes from before, which should go through these. Um, and then I'll, I'll be trying to update them, but it sometimes takes a while to just type it all out. Yeah. So. Cool. Other questions on any of these topics? Okay, so we have like three minutes left, <laughs> which is less than I was hoping. But um, are there any questions on any of the 
uh, the practice problems that I had given or the extra questions at the ends of the homeworks uh, that were particularly concerning. None at all. All of them were perfect. Okay. So I, I'll, I'll post solutions to this homework uh, probably sometime this afternoon. And the other homework solutions should all be posted along with the, the answers to the practice problems. Uh, like a square versus a circle versus an ellipse type of thing? Um, you know, like the plus speed um, around the crack metal versus like all the reverses. Oh, like. Uh, it's good to understand, uh, but I probably won't go into that sort of detail. Right, so that's. Um, Around, around the tip of a crack, you have some plastic zone that's either plasticity, city in metals, um, crazing in metals, crazing in polymer, or uh, micro cracking around the tip. Micro cracks. Um, yeah, you probably. It's it's good to understand that these are the mechanisms for plasticity, but I probably won't be asking too in depth of questions on that. Yes, it does. Yeah. So for failure surfaces, what I'm, that's a good question. So for failure surfaces, what I'm generally looking for is, uh, one, the rougher the surface is, the more surface energy has been put into the material to deform it. So you have um, this uh, energy release has a, a surface component and a plastic component. So this is the, the surface energy that forms plus the plastic energy dissipation. So if you have more surface area, there's been more energy dissipated in fracture. And then if you have plastic deformation or some sort of microstructural deformation, that also absorbs energy. Um, so, yeah, which is also what you should be seeing in the, in the Charpy impact test. For your brittle surface, it should be cleaner. For if you fracture glass, it should be a nice clean plane or silicon wafer, it should be a nice clean plane. But then if you were to break metal, so like in your uniaxial tension test, actually that's a perfect, in your uniaxial tension test, you had a rough cup cone surface for uh, metal, for steel and aluminum. But then for epoxy, it should have just kind of gone dink, and you should have had a nice clean flat surface for that epoxy, because it has a much lower toughness than the other two materials. There's a lot less energy dissipated in that fracture process. So yeah, that's a good question. But I, uh, it's, it's just kind of qualitatively understanding that the more deformation there is during fracture, the more energy gets absorbed and the higher the toughnesses are. So it's rougher if there's more deformation? Generally, yes. Cool. Thanks, everyone. I'll see you Friday.